Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining for the telehealth secrets. Uh, I apologize to being a few months since we had a talk. We've been a little bit busy with HIMSS and ATA and prepare for our own annual conference. But this week, we're super excited to kick off with uh, Keith, the president of Lucenia Health. And so Lucenia Health is a tech-enabled benefits management company focused on making prescription drugs more affordable. And Keith today will be shedding the lights you know, on everyone's minds. Why is just all this stuff just so extensive? You know, like what is going on with all the craziness with the US prescription drugs prices in there? And why is the US price just so much more expensive than everywhere else compared to everywhere else in the world? So Keith um, <clears throat> lectures on drug pricing at the UT Austin Business School. So we're really, really privileged to have him today. I like think once you hear his talk, he's really the world expert on this, just all this, like the craziness you see there. But one thing, something you might not know him is he's actually a lifetime drummer. <laughs> Great. And, um, and let me um, <clears throat> turn the floor over to Keith. And um, again, for the audience member, feel free to type your questions into the uh, webinar again. We're going to take the questions right after Keith's uh, you know, presentation. Uh, Keith? Thank you very much, Milton. And uh, I, I'm the one that really feels uh, honored to be able to share this information with your audience. We're big fans of VC um, over at Lucinia. And we really want to tell anyone who will listen uh, how drug pricing actually works in the United States, why some people pay exorbitantly high prices, um, how people can save money. Uh, and I think the more people know about how this system works, the better off everyone will be um, because it's it's really consumers that can help drive down the price of, of prescriptions over time. And that's what we want to see. You know, our mission is that everyone in America could afford the medicine they need to stay healthy. And so we, we want to help every single person do that. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. A, a little bit of background, we are refill wise. And, and uh, you can find us at refillwise.com and our product helps people save money when they can't afford their prescriptions or when they're paying too much. And by the end of this presentation, you'll understand uh, why companies like ours are needed. Um, you, can, you can get a card from us on the web. You can download our app uh, in the app store, just search for refillwise. Um, or you can text for our app. You can text the word join to the number 22822 and you can get a card that way. Totally free, bring it to the pharmacy, we can, we can help you save money. Um, the fact that we even exist, the fact that you could use a free product to help you save money on a prescription, shows you that there is a problem with our healthcare system in the US. And so the first part of this presentation, I'm gonna walk through how our pharmacy supply chain is structured, how prices are actually set, and then I'm gonna give you an example of one price of a, of a prescription drug and how each of the members of the supply chain make money along the way. And after that, we're gonna open it up for questions. Anything, you can ask any questions you want um, and I'll answer those questions and then everyone will have access to my uh, contact information and, and I'm happy to answer questions after the presentation as well. So I'm gonna dig in here and I'm gonna start with some graphics. This first graphic represents you and you're the patient, and we're gonna walk you through the workflow of how you get your prescription drug. And the first part of this is gonna be really obvious because everyone's been to the pharmacy before, but the part that happens behind the scenes is what most people don't know about. So let's start with you going to the pharmacy. We've all been there before, picking up a prescription, but we ought to talk a little bit about what a pharmacy really is. There are actually multiple types of pharmacies, and you all probably all know this, but let's start with drugstores. So drugstores are the biggest pharmacies in the US, um, pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens, uh, but there are also pharmacies in grocery stores and in mass market retailers like Walmart and Target and Kroger, and a lot of you probably go there. And then, although there are a few of them than, than there have been in the past, there are independent pharmacies. My family, uh, growing up, we used an independent pharmacy. And those, are, those tend to be local businesses owned by local individuals and you know, typically family owned or pharmacist owned. 
Uh, and then you probably all, all know this, hopefully you haven't had too much exposure to it, but hospitals and large clinics also have pharmacies. Now, most people don't take their prescription to a hospital pharmacy, so you only get prescriptions from a hospital if, if you're a patient there typically, although you can do. Um, but really the first three, drug stores, grocery stores, and independents, make up uh, pharmacies in the US. Now, these pharmacies, especially the drug stores, uh, their strategy is to almost be like a convenience store. They are everywhere. In fact, um, Walgreens uh, corporate saying is at the corner of happy and healthy, at the corner. They mean to be uh, you know, ev everywhere and very convenient, and they are. Um, and of course, grocery stores have their own strategy for where they place um, those retail locations as well. So that's the pharmacy that you go to. Each one of those is slightly different, but in general, they play the same role in this supply chain. So when you go to the pharmacy, you have two things. You have your money and you have your prescription. Now, oftentimes that prescription is actually electronically sent to the pharmacy, but the key is it's a prescription for a medicine that has been written for you by a doctor. And what the pharmacy has is the drug. This part of the transaction we all know. You give the pharmacy your prescription and the money and the pharmacy gives you the drug and you walk away and you're really happy. But what happens behind the scenes? So as you all know, a third member of this supply chain is the prescription drug manufacturer. Uh, a lot of times for short, this manufacturer is called pharma or sometimes big pharma. And this is the industry of companies that makes prescription drugs. So let's talk about this third entity in the supply chain. Prescription drug manufacturers spend a great deal of money on research and development. Almost 20% of their top line revenue is spent on retail and spent on research and development and into legal compliance. And in fact, if you look at the average uh, statement, financial statement from one of the large uh, pharma companies, you'll find all of them about the same actually spend a little bit more money in sales, marketing, and legal compliance than they do in research and development. As you're gonna see in this presentation, Pharmaceutical manufacturers do not set the price of the products they manufacture. Um, so they do not control that price. And in fact, there are other companies who do. So a lot of the times when you hear in the news that a pharmaceutical manufacturer is affecting that price, they certainly can affect it indirectly, but do not set the price on their own. I'll keep going. And if it happens again, let me know. I could always okay. try to reconnect. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. So uh, sitting between the pharmacy and the manufacturer is an entity called a wholesaler. These are massive companies. We're talking about Fortune 10, Fortune 20 companies. And many of these brands, people outside of the healthcare world, and even people inside the healthcare world, have never heard of them before. Um, companies like Amerisource Bergen, who a couple of years ago had over $130 billion of revenue. Cardinal Health, McKesson. These folks are wholesalers, so they buy drugs from the manufacturers and they sell to the farm. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, please. okay. Well, thanks for your patience. So uh, these are the biggest companies um, that most people have not ever heard of, and why, why would we want them in the middle between a manufacturer and a pharmacy? Um, and the answer is that the manufacturer likes to specialize in things that they do really well, which is R&D and compliance and making the actual drug. But imagine the challenge of logistics, of delivering the drug. This isn't like Amazon Prime one day delivery. Uh, these drugs have to arrive within sometimes an hour. They have to be refrigerated. There has, there's great care taken in how they're shipped. It's an incredibly specialized business, um, the logistics business of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so this, this middleman between manufacturer and pharmacy is the wholesaler. And they're gonna be important later on when we see their impact on prescription drug pricing. These guys are extremely low margin and extremely high volume. They, they, those top three own 85% of the market share um, in the US. And so that is you know, many, many prescriptions per year. Um, so that's our wholesaler, um, an introduction to them. So the pharmacy does not buy drugs directly from the manufacturer. Typically, they go through a wholesaler. And so the wholesaler receives money from the pharmacy. 
and so and the manufacturer delivers drugs to the wholesaler the wholesaler predicts the demand of the pharmacy and delivers those drugs so they are a middleman and they take a cut in that transaction so we've covered one side of the supply chain this is the supply side the idea of how the drug makes it to the pharmacy through a wholesaler but we also need to cover the demand side and as we know most prescriptions in the u.s are filled with insurance so you gave your prescription and some money to the pharmacy and they gave you a drug and that money that you gave them is very often a copay in an insurance um, calculation and so our question to ask is assuming that most of the prescriptions in the US are insured prescriptions and assuming that pharmacies do business with almost every insurance company the question would be don't pharmacies have a relationship directly with insurance companies and just like the pharmacy did not have a direct relationship with the manufacturer, they also do not have a direct relationship with the insurance company. There's an answer. Okay. So yes, yeah, so you, you would imagine that these, these massive pharmacies, you know, CVS, Walmart, Walgreens, would have direct relationships with the massive insurance companies like Blue Cross and Blue Shield. But in fact, they don't. There's a, there's a company in the middle that helps connect them. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that that company is the pharmacy benefit manager. Now, pharmacy benefit managers are also massive companies. And you might have heard of these before, whereas you might not have heard of wholesalers. So the leading pharmacy benefit managers, there are three of them. One's called Express Scripts. One's called Optum, OptumRx. And one is called Caremark. And as you can see on the next slide uh, with, with the list of the PBMs, um, these companies, these massive pharmacy benefit managers are actually owned by other businesses. So Optum, one of the largest pharmacy benefit managers, is owned by United Healthcare. And Caremark is actually owned by the pharmacy, CBS. And right now, Express Scripts is contemplating a a merger with an insurer as well uh, called Cigna. So um, these pharmacy benefit managers, although they're independent companies, each one has a, a different um, owner or parent company that it works with. Now what the pharmacy benefit manager originally did as an, as an entity is process prescription drugs. So imagine we're back in the 70s and 80s and prescriptions are given to the patient on paper but behind the scenes, all of the processing of the drug and understanding what price it should be and how to distribute it is also done on paper. And the insurance companies, not being in the business of writing large-scale computer systems, outsource the processing of these pharmacy um, prescriptions to this third party, pharmacy benefit managers, who wrote, back in the 70s and 80s, these computer systems. Um, they became prevalent. Uh, and became the backbone of processing prescriptions in the U.S., and the pharmacy benefit managers began to have some control over the supply chain in that they controlled the information. And we know in other industries, he who controls the information tends to have a lot of control over an entire industry, and that's what began to happen with pharmacy benefit managers. Um, these pharmacy benefit managers uh, then were acquired by the companies who originally outsourced business to them back in the day. And so companies uh, like um, Optum you know, being acquired by United Healthcare and, and Caremark being acquired by CVS show that the parties in the supply chain were looking to kind of shore up their control over the supply chain by gaining control of the, com of the companies that process these prescriptions. And you'll see how this works later when we go through our example. So. Let's go to our next slide, slide number 18. So what happens in this, uh, in this uh, transaction is the PBM negotiates with each party. They negotiate with the pharmacy to set the price of prescriptions, and then they negotiate with the insurance company to set the price that the insurance company will pay. And in many cases, the PBM holds both contracts, but
but does not share the pricing difference between the price that they negotiated with the insurance company and the price that they negotiated with the pharmacy. And the difference in those two prices, i.e. the difference in the price that you will pay as a consumer and the price that the PBM negotiated with your insurer is called a spread price. And that spread represents the difference between the two prices. Now, sometimes there is no spread and the price is the exact same, but sometimes there is a spread. And in that case, the PBM will keep the difference in uh, the price between the two entities. And I'm gonna show you an example of this later on. So the PBM, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, slide 19 has this contract that allows money to be exchanged between the PBM and the insurance company every time a prescription is filled. And of course, on the other end, money also exchange, if you go to slide 20, between the PBM and the pharmacy every time a prescription is filled. So the PBM becomes this middleman who does the hard work of processing prescriptions um, between these two entities and also um, keep, you know, has the record of money that is owed between the two companies. Let's go to slide 22 now. So here we're zooming out and we're gonna take a look at the entire supply chain. So remember earlier in the conversation, we looked at pharmacy, wholesaler, and manufacturer. And then the second part was looking at pharmacy, PBM, and insurance company. And in this example, you're not on the slide, the patient, but you're over there to the left of the pharmacy having, you know, having picked up your prescription and, and uh, medicine and dropped off your money. So there is another aspect to this relationship, one that has become fairly contentious recently um, that you should know about. And this is called prescription drug rebates. Now imagine that you are a manufacturer. You sell your product to the wholesaler, not directly to the pharmacy, but you'd like your product to be used. You're still a business. I mean, you, you have drugs that change people's lives and make people more healthy, but they still need to be prescribed by a doctor and filled by an insurance company. So for the doctor, who's not on the slide, you're gonna spend a lot of sales and marketing money reaching that doctor. You're gonna have drug representatives that go to doctor's office to teach them about your product and make sure that they prescribe it. And you're gonna buy Super Bowl ads uh, so that the consumer knows to ask the doctor to purchase, you know, to write the prescription because you're advertising to a consumer that actually can't buy your product. Um, you know, none of us can go out and just buy a drug on our own. We need a doctor to help us do that in the U.S. So, so you have this relatively inefficient channel of communication basically to doctors via drug reps and via consumers to reach those doctors. But what about the insurance companies? Well, as I mentioned, the pharmacy benefit manager controls the transaction between the pharmacy and the insurance company. And one thing that the insurance company relies on the PBM to do is to set what's called a formulary. Now, a formulary is simply the list of drugs you are allowed to take with that insurance. So your insurance will cover some drugs and it will not cover other drugs. So what started happening is pharmacy benefit managers started to go to manufacturers and offer them a position on their formulary, sometimes an exclusive position. So imagine you're the manufacturer, you want to convince the pharmacy benefit manager to put you on their formula. If you're on it, you're gonna get a lot of prescriptions written. And if you're not on it, you're not. Now we would like to think that those formularies are set based on which drug has the most value. You know, the lowest price and the highest impact. And it is true that pharmacy benefit managers and insurers go through a lot of work to choose drugs on their formulary that are the highest value but they also consider the amount of money they might make from the manufacturer. Because in the US, we have a clause called the Safe Harbor Clause that makes it legal for manufacturers to pay what's called a rebate to PBMs in exchange for a position on the formulary. So the PBM also has a contract with the manufacturer. And what happens here is every time one of the manufacturer's drugs is written, the PBM pays the manufacturer, oh, sorry, the manufacturer pays the PBM a direct amount of money. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that, that that money has changed hands on that individual prescription. And so for every prescription that the manufacturer generates, 
And these are mostly brand drugs, not generic drugs. The PBM receives money, called a rebate. And so the PBM calculates the value of that rebate in the overall economic relationship between themselves and the insurance company. Now, originally, the PBMs could keep a lot of these rebates, but eventually the insurance companies became aware of them. And so what the insurance companies did is negotiated with the PBMs to keep a percentage of that drug rebate. So if you look at slide 24, you'll see that PBM money gets split between the insurance company and the PBM. So now they are both benefiting from this financial relationship. Um, now, theoretically, if that money were solely used to reduce the premiums of people paying for insurance, price of the drug at the pharmacy, this wouldn't be a problem. But what we've seen in studies is that the price of drugs has increased even after this money has changed hands, and it's not always reaching the end consumer. And in the next um, uh, examples, where I give you actual dollar examples here of a, a specific drug, you'll see how this happens. So a lot of people find this problematic, um, but back for a good a PBM slash insurance company to have their drug on their off a formula. And there are benefits of the system. It's not, it's not. So we are now on slide 26. So one more slide. 26, we're going to start with a specific example. The name of the drug doesn't matter in this case. Let's just say it's a brand drug. The manufacturer starts off this process by setting the list price of the drug. So think of the list price. But in the example of buying a car is the manufacturer's suggested retail price, the MSRP of the, of the drug. So the manufacturer is setting the price of this drug to $250. Now, if we move to slide 27, turn the wholesaler, then negotiate. Remember, the wholesaler is going to buy a lot of this drug and then distribute it to pharmacies. So the wholesaler has negotiated that they are going to pay a 7% discount on the list price. So in other words, they're going to pay $232.50. So they're now out $232.50. And the manufacturer is up $232.50. And the wholesaler has a bunch of the drug. Go to the site. The wholesaler then goes to the pharmacy and negotiates what the pharmacy will pay. And they are going to take a little bit of money from the services they provide. So they've negotiated with the pharmacy that it's going to be a list price minus 5%. So the wholesaler has not made very much money. The pharmacy is now out $237.50, and the wholesaler is up 5 bucks. And remember, I mentioned that the wholesaler business model is high volume, low margin. So here you can see an example. This is just one example, but an example of how this, this happens. The wholesaler is touching a whole lot of these prescriptions, so they have a lot of $5. But the amount of taking on this individual prescription, you know, is very low. So our pharmacy needs to be made whole here. They, they're, they're out money. They've bought the drug. How can they do that? Let's go to the next slide. So now you show up. You're off the slot. You're off this screen, but we know where you are. You're right next to the pharmacy, and you've given money. Let's say you give a copay of $25. The pharmacy actually keeps that money. So now the pharmacy is out $212.50. Because they've collected your copay of $25. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to look at the other end of the equation. Okay. So let's take a look at the insurance PBM and pharmacy side. The insurance company is going to negotiate with the PBM a price of $235 for the drug. Now, the insurance company does not always know the actual price negotiated between the manufacturer and the wholesaler. They are guessing at what the price is in many cases based on some third-party uh, sets of data that, that everyone has access to. Think of these third-party data sources as similar, for those of you who have bought a car before, to the Kelly Blue Book, where you can go to a third party and see roughly what a car costs at MSRP and what it costs to make and the difference between the two. Those aren't actually certified by the car makers, but they're pretty accurate. 
Sometimes they're not accurate. Uh, and the same thing is true here. So the insurance and PBMs have done their best to figure out what that list price is, and they, they have negotiated a discount off of it, $235. Now, the PBM processes the transaction via a computer system. And so they're also asking for $5 for fees to do this service for the insurance company. And in this way, the insurance company will pay the PBM $240 every time that a prescription is filled. And then if we move to the next slide, the PBM will pay the pharmacy that $235. In this example, we don't have a spread between the two. And it'll keep its $5 in fees. So now the pharmacy is at $22.50 because of the deal negotiated with the PBM. But that single prescription, they paid more for it than they were able to acquire it from all sale. Now the pharmacy, of course, also wants to sell you some other stuff, milk, toilet paper, groceries, you know, whatever else that they're selling in their pharmacy. And so, of course, the pharmacy can make more money on this prescription or on this consumer um, via foot traffic in their stores. We're not going to cover that example today here. Um, so now we have the insurance company out $240, and the PBM has made $5. But the transaction does not end here. Let's go to the next slide. Let's remember our rebates. So in this example, this was a brand drug. And so the manufacturer has a contract with the PBM, and they're going to pay it out. On average, we are 25% of the list price of drug. So now, PBM receives from the manufacturer a rebate of $62.50. Originally, they would be able to keep all of that, but now they have deals with insurance companies, and largely, they actually distribute most of the rebate to the insurance company. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the PBM has passed $50, 80% of the rebate to the insurance company. And so now the insurance company is out $190. The PBM in this example has made $17.50, almost as much as the pharmacy who carries the drug. Wholesalers made five bucks and the manufacturer has made uh, you know, gross revenue of 170, but of course they have to pay to uh, sell and market and uh, manufacture the drug. Now, the insurance company seems to be out $190, but don't forget, they collect a premium. And so they're, they're going to get some money back in the form of premiums, and their goal is to balance how much they pay out in medical benefit with those premiums. Before we talk more about that, let's take a look at an example of where this rebate can be problematic. So let's imagine that you had not yet, as the patient, met your deductible. Remember, you had a $25 copay. And the list price of the drug was $250. But if you have not met your deductible, you do not pay the copay price at the pharmacy. You pay the list price. And so you would be paying the pharmacy $250, but the manufacturer would still pay the rebate, not to you, but to the PBM and the insurance company. So this is one example where if you're the consumer, this is problematic. You know, you, you would have liked to have received that um, rebate. And in fact, you would have liked to not have paid that list price. Um, so that's an example of where refill-wise can help the member. Uh, we call them members of our, of our product instead of patients. Um, or if, if the uh, person is completely uninsured, um, then there is no concept of a copay. They would always pay that list price. And so we're able to negotiate with those pharmacies and get lower prices. But even if, if refillwise didn't exist, just the general, um, this, this specific example can be you know, considered problematic. And so the U.S. government is starting to look at this more and more and has been suggested some ways that, that we can eliminate rebates or change the rebate system um, you know, to, to help everyone out. And everyone has an opinion on this. We are, we are um, you know, a little David in a room full of Goliath. So our goal is to help people save money by any means necessary. If you go uh, to the next slide, here's your, here's your uh, in, in my uh, easy example where I'm cleaning everything up nicely, in the insurance company a premium, they've made about 10 bucks on this transaction, um, you know, which, is, which is roughly, they're also kind of high volume, low margin. People like to think of their um, insurance companies as 
you know, extremely high, high margin businesses. But if you actually look at uh, their financial results, their core medical insurance side of their uh, business is actually re uh, very low margin. Now they own the PBM, so they can make a lot more margin um, by, you know, owning the PBM or, or in the case of CVS and Aetna, uh, the insurance company could even own the pharmacy. So, but this is, this is an example, this screen right here is just a great example of um, how we ended up from this transaction and where the money flowed. So you can understand when somebody says, oh, you know, that drug price is really high. It's the pharmaceutical manufacturer. I mean, this slide alone just shows you how little control they actually have. And the pharmacy, which is a retail store, um, does not set the price of its own product. That price differs based on what little card you show them, whether it's a refill wise card or an insurance card. So it's a really complicated system, but hopefully this example um, cleans it up for you. There are many different versions of this example and happy to share more information for people who want to learn more. But, but my hope is that this um, at least gives you a start of how, how to think about this. Uh, Milton, I've, I've got a few more slides um, that talk a little bit about the industry, but perhaps I could just stop there um, and see if there are any questions and see um, you know, and, and if not, I could talk a little bit about the convoluted system of ownership between these companies and give some examples of that. But maybe think, maybe stop there first and see if we have questions. Sure, I guess for our audience member, please feel free to start typing your question in there. We'll take them on the air in this. And Keith, thank you so much for this. This is like just absolutely fascinating. This is really, really useful. Maybe how about just ask the audience queue other questions. Maybe you can go to your next couple of slides. Yeah, no problem. So if we want to, there we go. Great. So here is an example, and this is not my content. Uh, this is from a, a wonderful blog um, called drugchannels.net. Um, but here is an example of the way that different companies own each other in this system. And so when we talk about, oh, this is easy, let's just eliminate rebates, or this is easy, let's just make a PBM act differently or make an insurance company or a pharmacy act differently. Um, wh why can't we all just figure this out? Well, not only are there unbalanced incentives between each of the members of the supply chain, and that alone is hard enough, but then they all own each other. So let's take Cigna. Cigna and Express Scripts um, are merging. And so Cigna is an insurance company and Express Scripts is a PBM. Now, Express Scripts serves the Walgreens uh, set of pharmacies, right? Now, let's look at Aetna. Aetna, who's, who's not on the slide, but Aetna and CVS are merging. Aetna is an insurance company. CVS is a pharmacy. But remember, CVS also owns a PBM. That's Caremark. Look at the bottom of this slide. Amerisource Bergen is a wholesaler, but Amerisource Bergen owns part of Walgreens via the Walgreens Boots Alliance. Uh, and Walgreens owns another, uh, or is in partnership with another um, mail order pharmacy slash PBM called Prime. Uh, and so they are partnered in that way. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but as you can see, uh, it's not so simple as just isolating um, and, and some might even ask for regulating e each of the members of the supply chain because they are each other. They own each other and they, they have very close um, and confidential business relationships. So untangling, you know, when you hear people say healthcare is hard or figuring out the problem with pharmacy in America is hard, you know, they're not just feeding you a line. It really is hard. It will be very difficult to untangle each of these billion dollar businesses from each other um, and design a solution that will work for everyone. Keith, this is really interesting. Thank you so much. This is I, I think one of the best uh, webinars we have ever done. <laughs> and we have done like a bunch of you. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. Then sorry for the problems. Hopefully it's working out. I can still see your video and the slides just fine. So <laughs> must have been something about my connection to, to go to.
Yeah, I think there's a go-to meeting, one of those weird things. We do have a couple of questions uh, queued up. Uh, I got the first question okay, comes from uh, Choi. So he's asking, so the reason the White House request for the big farmer to list drug prices on TV, is that really just pointless or? Yeah, isn't that so interesting? I, I'm so happy uh, that we got that question. So let's go back uh, two or three slides to our slide that shows all the players in the supply chain. Great, perfect. Now that you know the system, you know that listing that list price on TV is worthless. Um, it is useful in that is at least opening the eyes of a consumer who is uninsured about how much this drug might really cost. And so to the extent that we see these commercials on television all the time, that we could be educated about that price, mm -hmm. um, that is useful. But the price they are being asked to list is the price that ends up not actually being paid uh, by the majority of our of our members and and how could it be i mean you would have to customize each commercial for the viewer based on knowing their insurance to know what their real price was going to be um which you know perhaps technology will catch up and allow us to do that but today you know it's not the case and so it i i feel like it's a step forward in that it's at least getting those prices even if they're not accurate out in the open for us to talk about um this but no, that's that's not going to be the price that's typically paid. Got it. Yeah, that makes it very helpful. Another question from uh, Thomas. So he's asking, so for mail order prescriptions are often filled with no copay at all. So in this case, uh, who wins and who loses? Well, that is a great question. Um, so the whole world of mail order is interesting. Um, today we have mail order pharmacies the largest ones in the country are owned by pharmacy benefit managers. Mm. And so they operate those mail orders as an alternative to the pharmacy, the retail pharmacy that you would go to. And typically, the mail order pharmacies operated by PBMs are only accessible if you also have their insurance. So in the case of, say, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have a preferred mail order pharmacy. It's not the only one you can use, but it's preferred um, you know, and it's owned by them. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense that the copay on that drug would be zero or lower because they are going to have to reimburse themselves less mm -hmm. money that they, than they would have to reimburse, say, CVS or Walgreens or Walmart. Mm -hmm. So they want to encourage the use of mail order. Now, the reality is mail order is great. You know, we, we don't want to um, downplay the, the power that mail order has. And you know, we would be uh, remiss if we didn't mention Amazon in this conversation. They acquired a mail order pharmacy, not owned by a PBM, an independent mail order pharmacy called PillPack. Um, and in addition to mail order, of course, the retail pharmacies um, are now considering strongly the concept of home delivery. So it might not be mail order, but it's still going to feel the same because the prescription is going to be delivered to your house. And so I think what we will see in the future and not, not just because of Amazon. There are other independent mail order pharmacies that Amazon doesn't own that, that can put pressure on the retailers as well. But what we'll see is increased convenience mm -hmm. for, for the member. Now, remember, convenience when you're ordering toilet paper on Amazon is one thing. But these are prescription medications where when they are not convenient, people often don't take them. Mm -hmm. and, and when you don't take your medicine, you don't stay healthy. And so we're not only talking about um, you know, decreased health of people when prescriptions aren't convenient, but decreased health means more insurance cost. Don't take your medicine, say, when you're diabetic because you can't afford it or because it's not convenient, you're going to end up in the emergency room and that's going to be more cost. So there's a real um, ethical reason why we ought to try to make the supply chain more efficient. Um, you know, and things like convenience have a lot more importance when we're talking about um, you know people's health, then hey, I just I didn't want to go to the store because I was in my pajamas or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing um, how the retailers make things easier for for customers, which of course they will. Um, how the how the mail order pharmacies will fit in, um, and how prices will drop through all of this. That makes sense. I think in terms of like the I mean Amazon's are making all these you know, splash in their healthcare, like how big an impact do you see them able to disrupt? I mean, I feel like the slide you showed that all these complicated relationship, I just felt like there's so much entrenched power. I mean, do you think Amazon could even make a dent on that? 
Well, that's a great question. I, 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 I just, I think it's too early to tell. Um, of course, Amazon is, um, you know, one of the most innovative and, and, and amazing retailers to come along in, in the history of retail in the U.S. So no one ought to count them um, out of changing any industry. Okay. But, but you're right. They're, it would probably be easier for them to first fit into this model mm-hmm. than to try to blow it up. Um, with all of those um, companies owning each other and being so connected in the supply chain, you know, uh, Amazon, you know, in my opinion, and, you know, I, I don't speak for Amazon, but it would probably be best for them to try to enter the space simply fitting into this model and making things a little more convenient for patients mm-hmm. uh, and then see what disruption they could have. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, just uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, the press reported that some Amazon Prime members for the first time got an email marketing message from Amazon marketing the fact that they now have a pharmacy. Mm. So this was their you know, baby step into sharing with the world that they do have this um, offering mm. or sharing with America at least. So you know, I, I think we'll see those continued baby steps. But if you're a retailer competing with Amazon, you're always going to be watching them closely and, sure. and seeing what will happen. So we, we uh, at Refill Wise, we care about the lowest price for the consumer. So we welcome, you know, anyone who wants to do that and have partnerships with, with all the pharmacies. Excellent. So I have a question from David. Uh, so he's asking, so what is the function of a hub like ShortScript play within this like an ecosystem? Great question. Yeah, great. So, so one thing about this presentation is it does not cover the role of the doctor. Obviously, the doc, the role of the doctor is incredibly important. The doctors use, oftentimes, electronic health records, and then they send the prescription electronically to the pharmacy. So, for those of you on the call who know of the company SureScripts, mm-hmm. SureScripts writes software to help doctors write prescriptions and send them to pharmacies. And so to the extent that SureScripts could arm doctors with information about the price of drugs, we might be able to help people stay healthier. And why? Because imagine in an example, and this is a very real example for, for refill wise for our company, imagine you're a single mom, you have three kids, maybe one of them has asthma, and maybe you went to a free clinic. Uh, to to get di- for your child to be diagnosed with asthma because you couldn't afford a trip to the doctor. Maybe you're uninsured or you're underinsured, and you have um, you know a very high deductible that you're never going to meet and can't afford. So now you found out via a free doctor's appointment that your child has asthma, and you're going to go to the pharmacy. So the doctor wrote you a prescription for your child's asthma. You go to the pharmacy, but the doctor, she was not able to tell you the price of that prescription. Mm-hmm. She might not even know it, or, or heck, she's so busy, she might not even be able to care. And so you show up at the pharmacy, and the price is way more than you could ever afford. Mm-hmm. Who is the first call you're going to make? It's going to be back to the doctor, the busy mm-hmm. doctor, who's already in another appointment. So the nurse manager takes the call, but the nurse manager's busy running the clinic. Mm-hmm. And so... Suddenly, we've created extra burden on the doctor and her staff, people who are supposed to make our our patients healthier and their families healthier, to figure out cost. Well, SureScripts and other companies like them can create software that they can put into the electronic medical record system that would present prices along with the prescription. So doctors could begin to have a financial discussion with their patients. And refill-wise, we're on the cutting edge of this. So we want everyone to know that our prices are alternatives. And if the doctors also know this, they could share that, hey, I'm noticing that, you know, without insurance or with your insurance, mom, that your kid's asthma medicine is going to be, you know, 150 bucks. But with refill wise, it could be 30 bucks. That's just an example. I, you know, I don't, I don't have to look up the specific medicine, but it could be a lot cheaper. And we could help that mom get the prescription medicine she needs for her kid at a much lower price. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I think like, like I know like when I go see doctors, often they should write something. Yeah, I think if they have the option to tell me like, here's two comparable things, this is much cheaper, then you would really help out a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, people expect that from their doctors. And I, I, I just want to, you know, stand up for the doctors here. You, 
absolutely they should be having those financial discussions, but we have to remember it's not just a selection of an either or price because until you know your patient's insurance, that sure. price is different for every person. Exactly. And so, yeah, if I was just at Home Depot telling you to buy, you know, one one screw over another, it's easy. But now I don't know the price until you've told me about your insurance. Of course, doctors do have that insurance information. That's mm-hmm. how they bill. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot of burden for the patient. It's a lot of burden for the doctor. You know, we've got to make it easier. Yeah. We have a question from Gene. So, um, so that's the question is, so when a drug uh, turns generic, does the PBM benefit the most and do manufacturer rebates still exist for the generic drugs? Yeah, great question. So for the most part, um, drug rebates do not exist for generic drugs. And um, you know, give the PBMs credit. They have done an amazing job of, on behalf of the insurers, driving up generic use. So in general, in America, the, tr- the drug trend tends to be for more of generics to be prescribed and less brands to be prescribed. And that's because the PBM's job, the way they serve the insurance company, is to control costs. That's the whole point of that formulary control, mm-hmm. um, not to let drugs on that formulary that aren't um, you know, high value. In other words, low cost and, and high health benefit. Um, mm-hmm. So they do push generic usage, and I think that is very good for, for America. Um, and yes, when a brand drug comes off of patent, we see within days sometimes a, an immediate massive decrease uh, mm-hmm. in the price of that drug. Now, we shouldn't be so cavalier as to, as to ask for you know, every drug to be generic right away, because remember our financial statement for the manufacturer we reviewed earlier, 25% of that money that they're collecting for these drugs goes back into R&D. And although this system is incredibly inefficient, we want to make sure that the manufacturers are motivated to keep finding cures. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Um, Hepatitis C is a very serious medical condition. Once you have it, um, you can die from it. And at the least, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars over your lifetime to keep you alive when you have it. In 2015 and 2016, drug manufacturers released two brand drugs called Sovaldi and Harvoni that effectively cured hepatitis C with a drug. Now, those drugs were incredibly expensive, but the alternative, keeping that person healthy for their lifetime of having the disease was way more expensive than the drugs. And so on the surface, drugs that cost thousands of dollars seem like, how could this even be possible? Mm-hmm. And, and absolutely, you could certainly look at the amount of R&D it took to discover that drug as one equation to justify the price. But a, but a better one might be, what is the alternative of keeping that person alive and healthy? And if the drug does a great job, um, you know, even if it's expensive, we ought to want to find a way to pay for it. Now, we can still make this whole system way more efficient. <laughs> you know, And yeah, there are going to be drugs that are more expensive than others, but by and large, we would have mm-hmm. a less expensive healthcare system and people more healthy. Good. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have a question from Terry. So the question is, um, so why, you know, is there any within the U.S. Why not work within the context of international pricing index? So, for example, in other countries, they prohibit this or excess of pricing, but our government, right, we pay out billions of dollars in grants in research and development. But then we also, it's almost that like government pay for the lot of R&D, but we also get like the highest price in the world. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very frustrating, um, you know, as a citizen to feel like uh, we are getting ripped off, if you will, because you look at the price of drugs in other countries and it's less expensive. Yeah. And, and it's, it's absolutely right that we could make our drugs less expensive by fixing this system. For mm-hmm. example, this system, the way it's structured here, does not exist anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. So all, all, of, all of the major developed countries do not have the type of, of economics beside, behind their pharmacy supply chain that we have. So we can absolutely solve part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea that uh, the U.S. And, and grants to U.S. manufacturers are what's creating innovation um, in the world for prescription drugs 
Uh, you know, I would I would want to temper that statement. If you look at drug manufacturers and the ones who are making, um, you know, the most innovative drugs, a lot of them are not U.S. based. A mm. lot of them are European. Um, mm. And yes, the European system, which uh, if you want to Google for more information, that type of pricing system is called reference pricing. Um, it's it's where the price is directly set based on the health benefit based on the amount of money it would cost to treat the person otherwise and, mm -hmm. you know, a, a very, um, a, a much more medically set price. Um, that, that pricing system uh, is obviously more efficient uh, than ours, but mm -hmm. still the, the grants that our government provides and the money that our manufacturers make in the U S we, we have some amazing discoveries and you know, the U S is definitely a leader in that, but we are not the only leader. Uh, and so the key, I think, is is more about looking at our supply chain um, and finding a way to make it more efficient um, without necessarily fixed pricing drugs or trying to have more government control. I think there's a way you can put more power in consumers' hands mm -hmm. and, and increase transparency and and fix a lot of these problems and still have the amazing innovation that, that the U.S. Mm -hmm. delivers. That makes sense. I guess in terms of international side, I mean, so you, I think in most countries, it's actually illegal for the drug to direct to the direct the consumer marketing in this. Do you know why U.S. is maybe the exception in this case? For you know, I don't. I, I I have to admit, I don't know the story behind what I would imagine would be some form of lobbying. Okay. Um, I just know that I use it often as an example. Um, yeah of the inefficiency of the system. I mean, a great example is Viagra, mm -hmm. um, a drug that, that is incredibly beneficial to people's lifestyles, you know, that people mm -hmm. all over the U.S. know about. But manufacturers have bought Super Bowl ads for Viagra. They, yeah. They've spent, you know, many, many millions of dollars to educate teenagers, to educate young adults, to educate people who won't need the drug for 50 years. <laughs> I mean, I know what Viagra is. I, I might eventually need it. I don't, I don't use it now. But the, but the end result is an inefficient system of communication. That mm -hmm. Why would uh, an American business advertise like that? Well, mm -hmm. they would advertise like that because of the way this system is structured, that it actually, they can get a return on that capital investment mm -hmm. by making such an inefficient communication um, because the rest of the system is so inefficient that that's the way they deploy their capital. So if mm -hmm. we could fix this, we might also see a change there too. If we mm -hmm. fix the supply chain, we might not have to make those commercials illegal. They would just go away because they would no longer be good investment. Mm -hmm. And sense. so, you know, perhaps, you know, some people would say that's optimistic. And I, I certainly want this solved, you know, at, at any cost. But I, I do think that if you can make the supply chain more efficient, you can, mm -hmm. um, you can eliminate that. That makes sense. I mean, in terms of like, a, if you were to pick one country to uh, maybe there are replicate for the u.s like do you have like a country that you think they got there everything just like that's the right way to do things <laughs> oh i get asked that all the time uh and i hate i'm sorry but the answer is is i don't have one i mean okay uh, the, the european countries um you know the concept of reference pricing and and setting or at least influencing that price more than we do based on the medical benefit of the drug i do like that i'm mm -hmm. not saying that i don't but the U.S. is truly a unique experience and experiment. It, it has been since since we were founded. You know, our population is different. The rest of our economic system is different. Um, the the residue from how we've operated so many years, um, it, it would be impossible to copy and paste. You know, uh, yeah. say a, say a system from Europe and 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 expect it to work here. Um, we've we've always been a unique country, and this this will be a unique problem to solve for sure. Great. Keep okay, thank you so much for just like just such an amazing presentation. I guess um, if my final question for you is like, I mean, you share so many really interesting insights. Uh, Keith, is there one thing that uh, you believe that the rest of the world uh, do not believe yet you know, around this drug and digital health and so on? Ooh, good question. Um, well, I. And that would probably be another hour <laughs> conversation, but why don't I pick one? And why don't I pick one that's relevant to, to our discussion? Um, I actually think telemedicine could be a big part of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that one of the big inefficiencies with 
people getting prescription drugs in the U.S., especially for certain prescriptions uh, and for refills, is the concept of how they have to visit the doctor and the insurance mm -hmm. costs associated with that mm -hmm. and having to go to the actual doctor's office and then go to the actual pharmacy. Just like I think that home delivery mm -hmm. can uh, revolutionize how pharmacy works in the U.S., I think telemedicine can too. And and I think that's why I love you guys so much. I think there is a solution here, combining home delivery and telemedicine, that in some small corner of this diagram, it's not going to solve the whole problem, mm -hmm. can not only increase convenience, but can drive out cost. And and if we do those things, you know, we'll have a, a healthier uh, set of Americans. And so that I, I think that's um, mm -hmm. that's something that's really real. And I hope that I get a chance to talk more about that in the future as refill wise moves into that area oh definitely uh, keith we would love to have you back in the this is like just like i i thought that i learned so much from you in this hour thank and you, really, really thank you. Thank and you. thanks for the opportunity yeah we if, if if anyone has any questions i don't know if you post this if you want to post yeah. um way to connect with me on linkedin or or my email address or whatever uh you know i'm happy to happy to be as transparent as i can be Definitely. So what we're going to do is we're going again. So we're going to press the recording. We're going to post it. And also for the audience member, I apologize. Uh, we didn't get to everyone's questions uh, in the. But again, so we'll feed these questions to Keith. We're going to post them as a, you know, like uh, onto the recording as well. And then um, so for us, it's again. So thank you so much for audience tuning in. And then we're actually uh, pretty excited to gear up for our telehealth secrets conference, which will be held in October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th in the Silicon Valley here. So again, so please you know our website has gone live. You can see some of the you know key initial speakers up there. So definitely you know sign up and grab your uh, discounted registration right now. <laughs> Again, thank you again, Keith, for this amazing, amazing uh, you know, insight. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, thanks. Thanks, bye.